before we uh, read God's word together, I'd like to dismiss the children for for children's worship. I want to be able to so at this time. Yeah, we'll take a moment for the children for the children's worship. Probably three more up here. So you can head straight out to children's worship this morning. <coughs> Switch the order of things around. Let's uh, let's open our Bibles this morning. We're going to be reading today from John chapter 19, and uh, just two two. Uh, well, I guess technically three verses. John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. And during this uh, season of Lent, as we've been looking forward to and getting ready for uh, for Easter, we've been looking at the seven words that Jesus spoke from the cross, and because each really. Um, Taking together these seven words or seven phrases that Jesus speaks from the cross capture um, really the totality of what Jesus came to do. They, they sum up his work and his mission um, really so, so clearly. So we're taking time each week to just look at their, their short phrases most of the time, but they really get at the heart of what, uh, who Jesus is and what he came to do. Um, now, our text this morning actually has two of these last phrases. Uh, the one we're going to focus on is the one where Jesus says that I am thirsty. Um, and we will come back to the second one where he says it is finished. Uh, we will get to that, uh, I think it's on Good Friday that we plan to do that. So, uh, so just so you're clear what we're looking at. John chapter 19, 28 through 30. If you're using the Pew Bible, it will be on page uh, 1685. Page 1685. <clears throat> John 19, beginning at verse 28. Later, knowing that all was now and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked it in a so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Let's uh, turn to God and let's ask his blessing upon us. Lord Jesus, you promise to quench our deepest thirst with the gift of your spirit. And this morning we pray that we would... Um, receive that gift and that we would clearly see what you are speaking to us this morning. We pray that these words would be like living water for our soul, that they would point us to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that as I speak, uh, my words would come with clarity, with truth, and with grace. Lord, and together may we hear your word and may we be edified by it so that we may live in obedience and joy to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, uh, this passage of Scripture, this word of Jesus, I thirst. It's always been kind of a strange one for me. I, I've always known that Jesus said this from the cross. But it's always stood out as, as a rather unusual thing for Jesus to have said when he was on the cross. And I couldn't quite figure out why it stood out in my mind as being so unusual until really about a week or so ago. And here's what I... Here's what I think I came up with, at least why it's kind of an odd phrase for me. When you read the Gospels, you read, I think, as far as I can tell, in all the Gospels, nowhere does Jesus say, does, does Jesus express any kind of, of need. Now we know that he was hungry, we know that he was tired, we know that he slept, we know that he ate, but I don't think you hear at any point from Jesus himself I don't think you ever hear him say, I'm tired. I need to go lay down. I don't think you hear him say, 
boy, I'm really hungry. Can we, can we get something to eat? And I don't think there is any other place where Jesus says, you know, it's been really hot today. I'm thirsty. Let's, let's get something to drink. I don't think there's any place in any of the Gospels where Jesus himself expresses a need the way that he does here. And now here he is, he's on the cross. He's probably within minutes, really, of losing his life. And of all the things that Jesus could say, of all the needs that he could express, why does he say that he's thirsty? It's, it's kind of unusual. It's, I mean, he's been beaten. He has been uh, humiliated in front of everybody. He's been embarrassed. He's been abandoned by his friends, all these other terrible things, and yet he chooses to express his thirst. And that just has never, that's always seemed kind of odd to me. But you dig a little deeper into this passage, and you see there's actually a very important reason why Jesus says this. There's a lot of significance to what Jesus says. And you get a clue from that when John, as he's recounting these events for us, and as he's telling us what Jesus said and what he's going through, John makes it a point in this passage, I think he says three or four times, Jesus fulfilled what was written in the scriptures. All this took place to fulfill what was written. So even Jesus, his thirst was a fulfillment of scripture. Now, in what way? What, what, how is Jesus' thirst fulfilling the scriptures? Well, there are a number of places in the Old Testament where the writers talk about being thirsty. And one of those places is in Psalm 69. Now, it's a rather long psalm, and we didn't actually read it this morning, but if you're looking for something to read this week, particularly if you've been going through a difficult time for whatever reason, read Psalm 69. This is a psalm that was written by someone who felt abandoned by everyone close to him. In fact, it's a psalm that was written by someone who felt even abandoned by God himself. The psalm starts out, and, and the writer, writer was David, so far as we can tell, and we don't know exactly what he was going through, but he, this is how he starts out. He says, the waters are coming up to my neck. Lord, save me. Does that sound like a desperate cry to you? It is, isn't it? He's desperate. He's going through a crisis of some sort. And maybe the most bitter pill that the psalmist has to swallow is the fact that all the people close to him, the people that maybe he might have looked to for encouragement, for support, for love, They've all turned on him. Even his friends have become his enemies. Um, listen to some of these, listen to some of the lines from Psalm 69. Again, we don't have, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let me just see if I can capture some of the heart of what this psalm is about. The psalmist writes, they hate me without cause. Many are those who would destroy me. It is for your sake that I have borne reproach all day long. I looked for pity, but I found none. For comforters, but I found none. Ever felt that way? Ever been there before? You're looking around for people and people that you hope would be there, they turn on you. People you just get the sense that they're out to get you. They're trying to undermine you. People you once counted on have turned their backs on you. Have you ever been there? That's where the psalmist is. And then in Psalm 69, verse 22, maybe the most poignant description of what this is like. Listen to what he says. He's writing about the people who, again, he hoped would be there to encourage and help him. He says this. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me sour wine Poison for my food and sour wine to drink. Maybe you might say they rubbed salt in my wounds. They turned on me when I needed them the most. 
I was looking for refreshment. I was looking for nourishment. I was looking for help. And they gave me poison and stopped blood. This is a psalm that was written for anyone who's ever been hurt by friends, for anyone who's ever experienced rejection, for anyone who's ever gone through a time when you felt that even God himself was turning his back on you, whether it's an illness, whether it's a failed marriage, whether it's a broken family, whether it's an addiction, whether it's a struggle with sin, whatever it is that you've gone through. Psalm 69 is that cry to God for help amidst feelings of abandonment. There may be feelings of abandonment that are made worse when your closest friends turn on you. You know, I, I remember an experience, um, I've shared some of this before, I was about middle school and I wasn't the most popular kid in class. And You know, that's not easy when you're 12, 13 years old, but you sort of learn to deal with it, I guess, as best you can. I remember there was a time I was coming home on the bus, and it's always the kids in the back of the bus that cause the most trouble, right? Uh, and on this particular occasion, as so I'm coming home from school, I sort of learned to deal with the kids in the back of the bus. I was the first stop, and so I knew if I just deal with it, you know, I'm off the bus first, but I can get past it. But on this particular occasion, what, what was the most painful part of it was that this one boy who really was supposed to kind of be my friend, he joined in with all the kids in the back of the bus and started teasing me to them. And that hurt far more than any of the other teasing that went on from the other kids. I was used to them. But when your friend turns on you, that's the worst of all. That's the worst kind of experience. And that kind of experience, if you've gone through it, you know that it is indeed sour wine. Poison for your food. It is, isn't it? Now as we come to Jesus as he's suffering on the cross, we see that Jesus actually embodies this experience. Jesus drinks that sour wine of rejection, literally. He lives out what the psalmist describes. Now you need to appreciate, I think, the, the sad irony in all of this. Think back, if you will, if you, if you know a little bit about the Gospel of John, you might know that the very first miracle that Jesus does, it's recorded for us in John chapter 2. Remember what it was? It took place at a wedding. And you remember what happened at the wedding? The wine runs out. Major problem. And so what does Jesus do? He takes the water and he, of course, changes it into wine. And when the guests begin to taste the wine, they all say the same thing. They say, this is the best wine that we've ever tasted. Now, Jesus wasn't just trying to help a poor host out of a bad social situation. He, he was trying to give a message. He was really saying to his disciples, to the people, to us, look at what the kingdom of God is like. It's a celebration. It's a party, among other things. It's, it's rejoicing. It's people coming together and laughing together and <coughs> celebrating and rejoicing together. And the wine plays a part in that. The wine is part of the celebration. It's not about partying mindlessly, but it's about enjoying the fruits of good relationships and good friendship. The wine is a part of all that. Here's Jesus who gave this gift of, of good wine for fellowship and celebrating and rejoicing together. And now as he's on the cross, he's forced to drink the sour wine of rejection. He's alienated. He's excluded. His closest friends have turned on him. His disciples have rejected him. They've walked away from him. Jesus is drinking the sour wine of rejection. And in doing so, Jesus becomes the, the answer to anyone who has ever gone through that experience. Jesus becomes the answer. He becomes the one who really is saying, I will suffer this for you. I will suffer the rejection, the betrayal, the ridicule in your place. I will drink that sour wine 
for you. I came to bring the sweet wine of celebration and community and friendship and relationship. And to do that, I will drink the sour wine of rejection in your place. There's another layer to all of this. Jesus drinks that sour wine of rejection to bring us into the joy of his kingdom. There's another layer in all of this. Um, first, so often in, in the Old Testament especially, is a, is a metaphor for talking about our need for God. I remember this was about two years ago, and I was, um, I was asked to preach in, my, in the congregation, the church where I grew up. And so I was pretty excited about this. This was going to be a good opportunity. There was a church where I was baptized in, a church where I made a profession of faith. I went to a youth group there. A lot of people that I knew, and I was just really excited to, to be preaching that Sunday. That Saturday night, the night before I was supposed to preach, I woke up with food poisoning. So this was really a bad situation. But I thought, should I try to cancel this? Should I go through with it or not? And I decided, well, I'm probably this isn't going to be, you know, the greatest experience, but I'm going to go through it, I'm going to try to preach through this. And so I did. Uh, and by God's grace, I made it. No one ever knew that I was sick, thankfully. Um, but I remember part of that service, right at the beginning, before the preaching and everything, kind of like we do here this, this morning, with the singing, um, and the same setup in that church, the screens are behind, so I couldn't, you know, be up on the platform, I had to stand down below. And because I was sick, I was getting really thirsty. Like, you know, really thirsty, like when you're sick, you just are so desperately thirsty. And if I was standing up front, I could just, you know, take the glass of water and just drink it. But because we were singing the songs, I was down there. And the cruel irony is that there's a little table behind the pulpit right there that I could see the glass of water sitting on it like that. And then he's like in those TV commercials with the droplets of water just sliding down the glass. And, you, and I'm staring at this and I'm thinking, oh, I want to get to that water. I need to drink that water. And then... I kid you not, you know what song we started singing? We sang it this morning. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul. I have never been so thirsty in my life. And you know that the Bible actually, that's how the Bible describes our longing for God. It's a thirst. That song, Psalm 42, where we talk about the deer panting for water, you know we sometimes picture Bambi prancing through the nice forest, going to go drink the stream of cold water. That's not at all what the psalmist had in mind. The psalmist was picturing a deer that's on the brink of dying because there's no water to be found, and, and he needs that water now, and if he doesn't get it, he's going to die. And the Bible says that's what our need for God really is. It's a thirst, and if we are cut off from God, that we are thirsty, nearing to the point of spiritual death. We're desperately thirsty. We thirst for God the way we thirst for water. And this also tells us something about the nature of what it is to have a relationship with God. It's not enough to just believe that there is a God. Just like it's not enough to believe that water actually exists. You have to have it at the center of your life. You have to be so dependent on it that it is at the very heart of your well-being. That's what it is to need God. We need Him at the very center of our lives. And if He's not, we begin to shrivel. We begin to be dehydrated spiritually. Now, we put a lot of other things in the center of our lives. We try to quench our thirst in a lot of other ways. We use things like well, some of the more well-known ones, money, wealth. For some of us, it's our reputation. We need to look good in front of other people, and we're so desperate to impress people. For some of us, it might be um, relationships, romantic relationships, friendships. And we're so desperate to have them that we feel like if we don't, then we're going to die. But the thing is, when you're putting these things at the center of your life, it actually dehydrates you. If your need for, for approval, for example, is the thing that you live for, then you become almost insufferable to be around because you're always worried, what do people think of me? And if you are criticized even just a little bit, you take it as a deep 
personal affront. You get so offended because your reputation has been threatened. It's dehydrating you, isn't it? It's dehydrating you spiritually. You've put something else in the place of God. You're trying to fill that thirst with something other than God. And it dehydrates. It's like drinking salt water. If you put money in the center of your life, if money is what you're looking for to fill that need, then you'll find that you never have enough. You're always looking for more. You're never satisfied. And it actually hardens you into a, a very a person that you just you don't want to be. You might even look at yourself and you don't like how greedy you can become and selfish and manipulative. And it's because money, you're using money to quench your deepest thirst and it dehydrates you spiritually. That's what it's like to be apart from God. It destroys us. It destroys us from the inside out. It will leave us desperately thirsty. And what we see on the cross here is Jesus saying and, and living up, Jesus is really saying, I will become separated from God. I will become so desperately thirsty in your place. When Jesus is crying out that he is thirsty, he's not just talking about his physical need for water. He is saying, I am thirsty with the thirst of the psalmist who is longing for God's presence. Jesus is entering into that agony of being separated from God. He's entering into that, that lonely and parched place where he is being cut off from his relationship with God. His thirst here is the thirst of a soul apart from God. Matthew Henry was a scholar, pastor, writer back in the 19th century, said, to that everlasting thirst, we would have been condemned had not Christ suffered before us. That thirst would have been ours eternally Except that Jesus stood in our place and Jesus became that thirsty for us. And because Jesus endures that thirst, then he can make a promise to us. He can say, I will give you the streams of living water. I will quench your deepest longing. I will quench your thirst. There's another story that's told back in John chapter 4. John is no doubt intentional the way he tells us, but he's sitting down with a woman, and they are, of course, at a well, a place where you drink. And this woman, Jesus points out, has been seeking to fill that thirst in her life with relationships. Jesus says to her, go get your husband. And she says, well, I don't have a husband. Jesus says, yeah, I guess you're right. You, have not, you don't have a husband. You've had five. And the one you're with now is not your husband. What a thirsty woman. Someone looking for meaning. And Jesus says to her, I've got the water that you need. I will quench your thirst. He says that to us too. I have the water that you need. I have the living water. When I am in your life, I am enough. When I am with you, you will, your longings will be satisfied. Your thirst will be satisfied in me. You don't need to go looking for all those other things to fill that longing of your heart because I am enough. And so when you deal with rejection, when you deal with friends who turn their backs on you, when you deal with people who should have been there for you but weren't, of course it still hurts. But it won't destroy you because you will never lose the presence of Jesus. You'll have all these longings for other things, but... You may or may not get them, but you can know that Jesus fills the deepest longing of your soul. Jesus is enough. He must be the center of your life. Now, are you satisfying your thirst in Him? Are you, sad? are you looking to Him to quench that thirst of your heart and soul? Practically speaking, we know the answer is yes. And and yes, if that is what we profess, then it's true for us. But we also know that it can be easy to have one eye on Jesus and then still be tempted with other things, sports, money, relationships, and so on, to fill that thirst. So my question is for all of us today, what are you looking to to quench your thirst? Jesus is the one who is enough for us. You know, there's a member of our church, she's... Um, she no longer is able to attend. Some of you will know who I'm talking about. I won't leave her, but 
Um, she says sometimes, you know, she's older, she's lost her husband, and she says, I sometimes get lonely. Makes sense, don't you? She says, but I know. She goes positive, puts her finger up, but I know. But I never alone. I know that I never alone. That's the promise for us. Jesus has quenched the deep thirst of our heart. Jesus drank that sour wine of rejection to bring us into a new community. Jesus became desperately thirsty in our place to quench our longings, to quench our deepest thirst. Look to him. Be satisfied with the living water that he gives us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you gave so richly of yourself. You gave up everything. You became so desperately thirsty, not just in body, but in soul as well. And because you were thirsty, we are quenched. Lord, help us always to drink deeply of the living water that you give us. Help us not to look to other things to quench our thirst, but help us always to drink deeply from the well of living water that you promise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.